Um, I'm Stephanie and and I'm Kristen and uh, as Matt said we're going to be learning about engaging toddlers in active early learning today. So we wanted to give you a brief overview. We're going to start with some information about how toddlers develop and how they build pre-reading skills and what you as librarians and early childhood educators can do to help. And next we'll talk about a tool called Every Child Ready to Read and how you can design spaces collect and collections that support the five early literacy practices we will discuss. Finally, we're going to explore ideas for programs and activities that you can offer for this demographic, including many practical tips for engaging independent and active toddlers. Um, references and additional resources will be listed at the end, and the slides will also be made available, as Matt said. So don't worry too much about writing everything down. And we will have time for Q&A, and feel free to email us afterward, again, as Matt said. Um, so we're excited to get started. All right, so first we're going to start off by talking about what early literacy is and why it's important for toddlers. Next, we'll explore the specific developmental stages of toddlers, what they're capable of at this age, and how you can engage them and still support early literacy skills at the same time. We're also going to be talking about Every Child Ready to Read and the five early literacy practices. This is something that many of you are probably already familiar with, but we're going to start here because Every Child Ready to Read is really at the core of the programs and the services that we're going to be talking about today. If it's a new area for you, we'll be giving you the basics, and if it's something that you're already familiar with, hopefully we'll be able to present you with some new ideas and some new practices you can try out. So as many of you probably know, the early childhood years are crucial because the development of language and literacy begins at birth and is a lifelong process. Early literacy is very simply what children know about reading or writing before they can actually read and write. So why is this important? Research done by ALSC and PLA, which are divisions of the American Library Association, demonstrated that children who start kindergarten with strong early literacy skills have greater success throughout their school years. They are more likely to read at or above grade level by the end of second grade. Children who read at or above grade level by the end of fourth grade are much more likely to graduate from high school and be successful readers and learners throughout their lives. Parents play an essential role in this process as their child's first teacher. Librarians and early childhood educators are, who are privileged to work with these children and their families should support learning and development by modeling behavior in their programs, providing strategies, ed education, and research to allow parents to do this as well. We're going to explore many different ways to support early literacy development for toddlers throughout this webinar, and we wanted to give you a heads up that the next few slides are information dense, so feel free to jot down any notes or questions you might want to ask us at the end. So toddlers ages 12 to 14 months are on the move. They're using their bodies to learn and explore. They're walking on their own now. You'll notice that they're also using language and that they understand the world around them. You can start to help them build their vocabulary at this point. For example, when they say truck, you can respond by saying something like, yes, the truck is driving down the street. At this stage, they're also developing both gross and fine motor skills, and they're beginning to master some more finely controlled motions like scribbling or building with blocks. And they can understand and follow some simple directions, so just like, touch your nose. By 18 to 24 months, toddlers may say as many as 50 to 100 words, and now they're beginning to put those words into phrases and simple sentences. Again, you can help support and grow this vocabulary. For example, when a child says something like, more book, you can say, you want to read the book more, let's read the book. This is also a great age to start giving them some simple instructions to follow. While babies might just stare back at you, toddlers will now start following your directions. So you can try out things like, what sound does a cow make? Okay, now everybody moo like a cow. Playing and interacting with other kids at this stage is also important as it helps build social skills. However, their feelings and emotions can be a little difficult for them to handle. So sometimes this results in tantrums. And when this happens, they'll need an adult's help to calm down. 
By 24 to 36 months, toddlers are very active. They're running, jumping, and climbing. You want to give them opportunities to practice these skills, like playing a game where they hop to different objects, or practice walking backwards, or even hopping on one foot. By 36 months, toddlers may be using as many as 900 words, and they'll start asking questions. So continue growing that vocabulary by introducing new words. Instead of saying, isn't this book funny? You can try saying things like, isn't this book amusing or isn't it hilarious? You can also try asking them open-ended questions, ones that require more of a yes or no answer. For example, where do you think the squirrel is taking that nut? At this stage, kids are also beginning to use their imaginations more. They'll start engaging in pretend play, like pretending to feed a baby doll or making car noises while they play with toy cars. They can also start to pretend one object is something else. For example, a shoebox might become a bed for a stuffed animal. And at this age, they really want to make friends and they enjoy playing with other children, but they still need some help at times. You can help them out with conflicts that may arise, like sharing or turn-taking. Though again, tantrums or meltdowns will probably occur and are something that parents will need to help out with. Thanks, Kristen. So now we're going to talk a little bit about Every Child Ready to Read. So you may have already attended the Ready to Read at New York Libraries training opportunities that are currently being offered around the state, and you may know some of this information already. Um, but as Kristen said, it's really important, so we want to um, kind of walk through it again and make sure we're all on the same page. So Every Child Ready to Read at Your Library is a parent education initiative and toolkit developed in partnership with the American Library um, Association, Public Library Association, and the Association of Library Services to Children, in addition to national researchers. This initiative is based on research that found that public libraries could have an even greater impact on early literacy through an approach that focused on educating parents and caregivers. The theory is that if Primary adults in a child's life can learn more about the importance of early literacy and how to nurture pre-reading skills at home. The effect of library efforts can be multiplied many times. It is important to note that while modeling practice through programs like Storytimes is an important component of early literacy development, in Every Child Ready to Read, parent education, usually through dedicated workshops, is really the primary focus and intent. So how do children actually learn to read? Learning to read involves two key sets of skills, decoding and comprehension. So first, children must learn to decode print. They need to understand that the words they hear and say can be written with letters, which are the code. They also need to learn that these letters represent the sounds that they hear in words. Second, children need to understand or comprehend what the print says. They need to learn the meanings of individual words, and they need to be able to understand those meanings in the context of books or stories that they read. Both sets of skills are critical to becoming a successful reader. Every Child Ready to Read provides easy ways for parents to help their children master decoding and comprehension through specific skills and practices. The first edition of Every Child Ready to Read incorporated a six skills framework based on the work of Whitehurst and Lonigan. The skills presented in Every Child Ready to Read first edition were print awareness, letter knowledge, phonological awareness, vocabulary, narrative skills, and print motivation. Please note this is not the most current version of Every Child Ready to Read. Feedback from early adopters determined that these skills were too difficult for parents to remember, so the terms are no longer used with parents in the second and most current version of the tool. Why then, you might ask, am I spending any time on it? I think here there is a finer grain breakdown that's helpful to librarians and early childhood educators with their best practices. So by looking at the six skills, um, we can learn more about the ways that children read. Um, so just to do a, a little bit of explanation, print awareness um, is understanding that print carries meaning and being able to distinguish print from images. It's also as simple as knowing how to handle a book. Letter knowledge is knowing the names, shapes, and sounds of the letters of the alphabet, so that one's pretty straightforward. 
Phonological awareness is understanding that words are made up of sounds or phenoms. Uh, the ability to notice and work with the sounds in language is part of phonological awareness. Vocabulary is another straightforward one. It's a child's knowledge of words' meanings and knowing the names of things. Narrative skills has to do with the ability to understand and tell stories and to describe things and events. And print motivation is a child's interest and enjoyment in books. So um, the enjoyment they have associated with reading. Again, while I think these, I still think these terms are helpful for librarians to know, um, the second version of Every Child Ready to Read replaces what some consider this academic jargon of the six skills with five simple but powerful practices that parents and caregivers can use to help young children get ready to read. And we're going to discuss them in depth in the next um, slides. Uh, so they are talking, singing, reading, writing, and playing. So as I said, now we're going to kind of dive into these. So the first two early literacy practices, the ones that we tell parents about and encourage them to use, are talking and singing. And um, these are also the ones you can start with the youngest children. Obviously, children talk and sing before they read or write. So talking with children helps them learn oral language and is one of the most critical early literacy skills. The experience of self-expression also stimulates brain development, which underlies all learning. Singing, which also includes rhyming, increases children's awareness of and sensitivity to the sounds in words and helps prepare children to decode print. Uh, talking helps develop all of the six skills we talked about in the previous slide, so print awareness, letter knowledge, phonological awareness, vocabulary, narrative skills, and print motivation are all embedded in talking. Singing and rhyming are especially effective at developing letter knowledge, phonological awareness, and vocabulary. So what can you do to support these practices? Chances are you're probably already doing many of these things, which include teaching children and their parents rhymes in story time, modeling how to use enriching language with children, using flannel boards to tell rhymes or stories, encouraging children and caregivers to sing together, incorporating music and instruments into your early literacy programs, and providing access to children's music CDs that can be checked out. We do these things with intentionality because we know that nursery rhymes aren't just cute, they actually help children develop narrative skills that will later help them understand what they read. Similarly, using props like flannel board pieces doesn't just help recapture wandering attention, they also help children with comprehension and remembering the sequence of a story so they can tell it again in the correct order. Let parents know that by reciting nursery rhymes, they're helping their child to hear the smaller sounds in words, and they're helping their child build a strong foundation for how to read. Rhymes can also aid in social and emotional development. By incorporating them into a routine, you can use rhymes to ease transitions. For example, wiggle, wiggle, wiggle your fingers ends with, there are no more wiggles left in me, and now I'll sit as still as can be. This type of code helps children to regulate their own behavior and can help you and parents avoid power struggles with independent toddlers. Story times are also a wonderful opportunity to encourage parents to sing with their child. Remind them that even if they can't sing on key, their child is looking for familiar sounds from a person they love. Singing is another way of building phonological awareness because when we sing, we stretch out the words and focus on different syllables. Singing also aids in memory and can help children learn important concepts like the ABCs. Let caregivers know that singing and playing music in a group also encourages social responsiveness and helps their child to feel comfortable in a group setting, which will be important for school readiness later in life. So the next two skills are reading and writing. Reading together or shared reading remains the single most effective way to help children become proficient readers, and that's very important. Um, writing and reading go together. Writing helps children learn that letters and words stand for sound, and again, that print has meaning. So reading develops all six of the early literacy uh, skills, and writing helps children learn about print, 
letters, phonological awareness, uh, vocabulary, and narrative skills. So how do you support these practices? Again, you probably already do many of these things, including you provide access to books in the collection, you offer readers advisory services, you read to children in story times and other early literacy programs, you encourage parents and caregivers to read to their children, you model strategies for reading with young children, you facilitate crafts or that involve drawing or coloring or tearing, and you may provide crayons to use or coloring sheets to take home. Again, I want to talk now about why we do these things. So you might already know why, but don't forget to tell parents. Um, for example, tell them that books often have words that we don't use in everyday language, so they help build vocabulary. Children draw on that vocab when they are learning to read and trying to figure out what a word is. They are much more likely to be successful reading the word if they are already familiar with it from hearing it. When you read a book, occasionally point to the text running your finger along the printed words. This helps children understand that you're reading the words and not the pictures. Other times you don't have to actually read the story aloud for it to be a benefit to the child. If the attention isn't there, try simply looking at the illustration in the book and talking about it. Don't shy away from using crayons, markers, or chalk. I know it can be messy, but scribbling is the beginning of early writing. It takes a lot of coordination to write, and children need practice. Children also need to be able to coordinate the small muscles in their hands and fingers. So finger plays like the itsy bitsy spider or open shut them help develop these muscles. So do things like um, cutting with scissors or tearing paper is a similar motion. Um, there are the same skills involved in writing and in basic tasks like tying a shoe or fastening a button. I can't tell you how many toddlers I've seen learn how to cut for the first time in one of our story time programs. Um, again, it's a skill that takes a lot of coordination and practice from the child, and it's not necessarily something that parents are eager to do at home by themselves. So the last one is play. Um, and as the director of Play to Learn Services at the FFL, I'm constantly reminding patrons of all ages about the importance of play in our lives. After all, what is the library if not a place to learn in a fun, dynamic, and participant interest driven way? The fun part, I think, is very important for all ages, but it's also one of the primary ways that young children learn. General knowledge is an important literacy skill involved in playing that helps children understand books and stories once they begin to read, and it also helps them understand the world around them, like role playing, for example, and pretend play. So how do you support play at the library? You offer fun literacy building programs like story time. You deliberately incorporate time for play into the story time or early literacy program. You develop, you might develop free play programs, and we'll be talking about some examples of that later in the webinar. And you probably provide toys or play spaces in the children's room and around the library. Playing can actually be much more than it seems. For example, when a toddler is building with blocks, they're also building mathematical skills and scientific thinking. Through that play, the child is learning how the blocks can be balanced, they're observing how they fall, and discovering what fits together. Early experiences with play, like in a story time setting or a public place, form the architecture of the brain and lay a strong foundation for social and emotional development. Playing with other children at the library and experiencing the fun of interacting with other kids, taking turns, and sharing is essential. It is also a crucial part of school readiness. All right, we know that was a lot of information, so thank you for sticking with us. In the next two sections, you'll be able to see how the characteristics of those developmental stages and the research we've discussed really inform our best practices for collections, programs, and spaces. Here, we're also going to move from research and tools into collection development tips. We'll explain how the FFL reimagined our children's spaces to better support early literacy practices. 
And then we're also going to talk about how we reconsidered the way families discover and access traditional collections like board books and picture books. We'll discuss how we developed and implemented some non-traditional classification systems and introduce some non-traditional items like early literacy kits. So did you know that a child's environment influences their learning? Library spaces can be designed to support the development of early literacy skills. For example, many of the features in our children's room, pictured here, were selected with the research behind every child ready to read in mind. So I'm going to go over some elements of the space. Um, first, we have picture bookshelves. They're lower shelves with books at eye level, which helps to encourage reading because kids are more likely to see the books and, and pull them off the shelf, as you probably know. We have board book units that are only about two feet tall and they're set up in a cubby style that allows toddlers and babies to easily grab books and parents to quickly put them back. Um, there are rocking chairs and a comfy rug adjacent to the collections, which encourages shared reading in the space. We also have activity cubes on the rug for babies to sit and play with because the space is really designed for the whole family. For slightly older toddlers and preschoolers, we have four AWE computers. Um, these early literacy stations are designed specifically for our youngest patrons and feature over 4,000 localized learning activities. So they're fun, engaging games that are all on um, educational topics like math, science, nature, reading, etc. The AWE computers are always on and accessible as we do not want to create unnecessary barriers for children and parents to access the technology in the space. We will also notice that there is an adult computer station just to the right side of the kids' computers, and this allows adults who log in with their library card to have complete access to um, the internet, to email, uh, so they can work on stuff and still be within arm's reach of their child. In addition to the technology we offer, we also have classic toys like our puppet theater, which encourages talking and pretend play. My desk is actually next to the puppets, and I'm often delighted with impromptu shows. These children who participate are having fun, and they're building narrative skills at the same time. A small table next to the ramp contains crayons and coloring sheets to encourage early writing skills. And finally, way off to the left of the children's room is a smaller space called the FFL Family Room, which has a number of play elements we will describe in the next few slides. So what is now the FFL Family Room actually started out as our story time room and was an underutilized space in the library. <clears throat> The room was used a few times a week for early literacy programs and housed a staff desk, but was closed the rest of the time. As part of our assessment model and our philosophy of continuous improvement, we as a team began to think about how we could rework the space um, to provide an opportunity for learning and engagement that would be accessible to families all hours that the library is open. We wanted a space that was inviting, open, accessible, and educational for families and children of all ages. Through staff forums, team brainstorming, and research, the FFL Family Room was created. Like the rest of the children's room, we made sure that the space had toys and interactive features that support all of the five early literacy practices. The space includes a whiteboard wall that supports scribbling, drawing, and writing, it has a train table that allows for pretend playing, and uh, the train table is actually the hub of the room and often has many children around it playing together, which also encourages the development of social and emotional skills, like taking turns and sharing. We have Duplo blocks for building, which are encourage play, but also those mathematical skills we mentioned. We have puzzles, which again support play, but are also building math skills like spatial awareness. And we have more comfy chairs for shared reading. You can also see there is a television and we provide music CDs. Um, the children's music collection is actually located in the family room, so families can grab a CD or a children's movie and just pop it into the TV to sing along. We have a chalkboard easel for writing and drawing and large cardboard blocks for building. 
we recently added a produce stand for pretend play and talking. The stand was a great purchase as it can be repurposed for many different pretend play games. So this month it is a produce stand with pretend food, but another month it could be a bank or an ice cream stand. Um, Katie Solo of Storytime Katie did a great post on interactive play features like this one if you needed additional ideas. The family room has, the FFL family room has become the perfect place for play and early literacy development before or after a library program. Research shows that clustering objects together helps create sustained, independent engagement, and our results bear this research out. We've noticed a pattern where on Tuesday through Thursday mornings, do droves of families come in for morning story times, but instead of leaving after the program, they stay and head to the family room. Kids get to play and make friends, and parents do too. Then around lunchtime, many families head down to our cafe, which is also a kid-friendly space with a second train table and many toys and puzzles, and they eat lunch in the library. Thus, we have created an environment that uses a 30-minute story time and turns it into hours of engagement with the library. While you may not have any large convertible spaces, think about how you can make small tweaks to your space to create cozy areas for shared reading and play spaces for engaging with library materials and other children. Think about providing access to many different materials like books, toys, and writing implements all in one area to encourage children to stay and play longer. So now let's talk about reading with toddlers. Now these are some tips that we're going to offer to you, but these are also things that we say to parents all the time and that we would encourage you to also pass along to parents and caregivers as well. So first and foremost, young children can only sit for a story for a short time. You can't really expect a toddler to sit and pay attention for a full 30 minutes, so let parents know that you understand this and it's okay if their child's attention wanders sometimes. Let them know that reading, even if it's just for a few minutes at a time, is okay and not to worry if they don't always finish the story. Now, you may notice this is something that was discussed in the previous webinar, but we think this is an important point that bears repeating. So now you, as the story time facilitator, you'll want to finish the books most of the time, but again, just understand and make sure that parents know it's okay if a child's attention wanders. We encourage parents to bring the child back to the group when and if they can, but really we'd much rather have a child who has fun and positive associations with reading and with the library rather than one who's being forced to pay attention and really isn't enjoying himself. Now, if you feel like the group isn't really paying attention, you may have to switch gears. As storytellers, Stephanie and I have both given up on books partway through and switched activities. You just have to sort of smile and say, okay, that's enough of that. Now let's all sing a song. You can always go back to the book later in the program. And don't forget that story time is for parents and caregivers as well. Try to get them to participate as much as possible. This can model good behavior for the child, and children might be more inclined to participate and pay attention if they see their parent or caregiver doing so. This also has the additional benefit of helping parents remember what you focused on that day in story time and they can bring it up later at home. A really simple way to get parents involved more is to offer handouts. In the past, we've used handouts with the lyrics to the songs or the rhymes we were using that day so the parents could easily sing along. And we've also given out handouts with some at-home activities that were designed to reinforce what we talked about in story time that day. Now, in a story time setting with multiple children, you might not have as much flexibility, but you can always encourage parents to let their child decide how much or how little time they spend reading at home. Parents don't need to read every page. You might find that a child has a favorite page that they want to spend more time on. They might want to linger there and then switch books or activities. When you let a child explore books in the ways that specifically interest him, the reading experience will ultimately be more meaningful. When you're reading to toddlers, you can also talk or sing about the pictures. You don't have to stick exclusively to the words on the page in order to tell a story and to keep the child's attention. Children will love the opportunity to interact and talk and sing with you while you're reading. 
Some books have songs incorporated in them already. Pete the Cat is a great example of this, but you can always find ways to ad lib. So for example, if you're reading a book about a birthday party, you can just stop at one point and ask everybody to start singing happy birthday together. You can also let the children help turn the pages while you're reading. Toddlers will love to help you turn the pages while you're reading a book. And this is also a great strategy to use in a story time setting. If you have a child who's trying to take the book away from you while you're reading to the group, instead just hang on to it and encourage them to help you turn the pages instead. You can also try to make reading more interactive. If a child isn't showing interest in the story, try making it more of an interactive experience for them. If the story mentions body parts, ask them to wiggle their arms or stomp their feet when those body parts are mentioned. If the book is about animals, you could ask, okay, what sound does this animal make? All right, now let's all bark like a dog. You also want to ask questions about the story and let children ask their own questions too. This is sometimes called dialogic reading, and you can use the story to have a back and forth conversation with your child, even if they aren't talking back yet. Talk about familiar activities and objects you see in the illustrations or read about in the story. Ask them what they think will happen in the story or just give them simple prompts like, tell me what's happening on this page. Though we certainly want to encourage good listening skills during programs, it's also important to give children those opportunities to talk with you before, during, and after a program. And remember, it takes longer for younger children to respond to questions so we really need to be patient and wait anywhere between 5 to 12 seconds to give them enough time to respond. This might feel like a really long time. This would definitely feel uncomfortable if you were to try this with another adult, but it's important to give children enough time to really think and respond. You can also make reading personal. Talk about your own family or your pets while you're reading a story. In a story time setting, you can ask the children who has a certain type of pet or what their names are. You can ask them about specific family members, really anything that might connect their world to what you're reading. And finally, you should always encourage parents to make books a part of their daily routine. Just remind them that the more books are present and woven into a child's everyday life, the more likely they'll be to enjoy books and reading. So I'm just going to elaborate a little bit on what Kristen said and talk about what kinds of books you might choose to read with toddlers. And we're not going to dive too deeply into any specific titles because part of the fun is discovering your own favorites and the favorites that your group has. Um, but in general, uh, try to pick books that are short and I try to pick books that are short and engaging because our toddler group runs young and active. So um, try books that tell simple stories or that rhyme books with words that have a common refrain that you can repeat. Again, like Kristen said, to make it interactive. Um, so an example of that is brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? You could have the adults and children repeat that phrase with you. Uh, books about counting the alphabet, shapes or sizes are great because uh, they develop concepts that toddlers at this age are starting to know and understand. Again, as Kristen mentioned, books like these are a wonderful way to engage your audience by asking them to identify the shapes or colors or to hold up fingers and count along with you. Toddlers love animal books, vehicle books, and books about playtime. I do have one example here called I Spy on the Farm, which is a fun twist on an animal book because it gives clues and allows the toddlers to guess which animal you're describing. Pop-up books, pull the tab books, and touch and feel books are always popular. Pop-up books in particular can be hard to circulate because they are so delicate and easily ripped by small hands. But if you have a few special non-circulating story time titles, they're wonderful to pull out. Pop-ups are instantly engaging and surprising to toddlers. Finally, consider selecting books with humorous words and pictures. Children at this age will begin to understand silly stories a bit more and will giggle with delight at amusing antics. So now that we know what kind of books to select and how to best encourage toddlers and families to read them, how do you create access to the books themselves? With toddlers, we use both board books and picture books during programs. 
Some toddlers may be able to sit through longer picture books, especially if the story is more interactive and engaging, but the shorter length and the sturdy material of board books are still appropriate for most toddlers. As Stephanie mentioned in the last webinar, we have a nice sized collection of board books, which we add new titles to monthly. A few years ago, we took time to rethink this collection and made some changes to increase access and browsability. Instead of shelving the books by author or in no order at all, we chose to categorize each board book by topic. Topics include things like rhyming, ABCs, animals, colors, daily life, so on. Each book has a colorful sticker on the front that clearly matches the label on the shelving unit. This makes it easier to browse, explore, and find titles, but it also makes reshelving and shelf reading a lot easier. Our picture book collection is one of our highest circulating collections in the library, and we're currently in the process of classifying it into categories, similar to the board book collection. You've all probably experienced the same situation. A parent approaches the desk with what they think is a really simple reference question. My child loves trucks. Where are all your truck books? Instead of pointing her to one spot, you probably have to tell her that they're scattered throughout the entire picture book collection and that you'll have to run a list and help her locate them one by one. So if you get questions like this often, you can probably easily understand the value of a system that would enhance browsability by topic and would allow you and the patron to locate and explore relevant titles more easily. The goal of the picture book categorization project is simple. We want to make the collection more accessible and to help kids, parents, and teachers find the books they're looking for. We also want to help them discover other titles they might be interested in. In practice, it can be a little trickier to implement, but we know it'll be worth the effort. We have identified six main categories for picture books, and we've developed specific criteria for each one. The categories include stories, growing up, let's learn, our living world, my community, and holidays. And you can find some more information about the categories and what they include on the FFL website, and you can see the link posted right here. Each category is designated by a specific color, and we're now in the process of classifying and stickering the books and updating the call numbers for each title. This sometimes forces us to really spend some extra time and think about where we want certain subjects or topics to go, and where we think patrons might look for specific types of books as well. However, in the end, the result is a collection that's organized in a way that is more intuitive to the patron and easier to use, browse, and discover. In addition to our board book and picture book collections, we also provide access to a resource for toddlers called the FFL Ready to Read Kits. Each kit is based on one of the six early literacy skills like vocabulary or print awareness and contains three picture books that are especially useful for building that skill. For example, The Napping House by Audrey Wood is a great book for vocabulary because of all the synonyms it uses for napping, like snoring, dreaming, dozing, snoozing, and slumbering. These words that are great for children to know, that, but we'd probably never say them in everyday life. The kits also feature a unique laminated insert that suggests extension activities and tips for reading with toddlers, encouraging parents to talk, sing, read, and play with their children and write. Uh, while, explaining, uh, to, while explaining to parents why these are vital to their child's development. Often referred to as story time in a bag, these early literacy kits are favorites with working parents who may not have the time to attend traditional programming. Types of books, just briefly, to look for um, to highlight the different skills um, I'm going to go through for each one. So the first one is letter knowledge, and um, books to look for that help with letter knowledge would be shape books, alphabet books, and the search and find or I spy types of books. Um, to reinforce vocabulary, look for books with unusual words not used in everyday language. Try nonfiction books or concept books. To develop phonological awareness, select books with rhyming, alliteration, or tongue twisters. Try books with sound effects like animals or vehicles, 
or a book that can be sung or is written in a song format. To enhance narrative skills, choose books with repeated phrases, books that are have cumulative tales, uh, for instance, a story that, that builds um, on each part, or stories with strong plot lines that have a very clear beginning, middle, and end of the story. To reinforce print awareness, choose books with few words per page or books that have writing in the illustrations. Um, so books, for example, with um, word bubbles are great to point out the words that the characters are speaking, or books that show environmental print, like signs. Finally, to foster print motivation, which remember is the enjoyment of books, choose any books that your child or the child really enjoys, um, books that you have fun reading aloud or true stories. And as the librarian, you can um, assist with that via Reader's Advisory. So now we're going to talk about some of the specific programs we offer for toddlers at the FFL. And hopefully we'll give you some practical ways to incorporate what we've talked about so far. Stephanie is going to talk about First Steps, which is our toddler story time and music and movement, which is more of a music class for toddlers, but it's also active and lets them move around and use their bodies. I'll talk a little bit about a newly developed program at the FFL known as Art Lab. This program focuses on exploring art and the creative process. Stephanie will discuss Smart Play, which provides a space for children and parents to explore and play on their own. And finally, we'll share our philosophy on siblings and how to be inclusive when you have children of different ages in your programs. So as Kristen said, the first program is First Steps, which is our toddler story time. In First Steps, we sing, talk, say rhymes, read books, and play, incorporating all of the major ways of building language. We also make sure to include tips for parents and to explain why we are doing these things to teach families about the importance of early literacy in each session. We start off by singing a walking song, which gets restless toddlers up and moving from the very beginning of the program. It also helps parents understand that we have realistic expectations for their young child. Often I will even tell them that First Steps is an active group and that we do not expect that children will be able to sit for a full 30 minutes. After the walking song, we clap hello to each child, which gives each child a moment of individual recognition at the beginning of the program. It's also a great way to learn toddler names. Remember them throughout the program if you can, because calling a child by name is the best and most reliable way to get their attention and to refocus them on the book or activity you're trying to facilitate. With older toddlers who need less help or who might not seem to be paying attention anyway, it can be tempting for parents and adults in the group to talk, talk amongst themselves. Remind them that it is important for them to participate because their toddlers will imitate them. As Kristen mentioned, we always make sure to involve parents as much as possible by giving them song sheets or instruments or props to reinforce that they are also part of the program. We use more active rhymes with our toddlers, ones that allow them to get up and move their bodies, like Ring Around the Rosy, the Hokey Pokey, or Head, Shoulders, Knees, and Toes are all good examples. And I usually read about two books um, and use one read-along or focus book where each child or caregiver gets a copy. Um, these are the same books that I use with the babies, but I continue to use them with the toddlers because I feel um, even if they're running around the room most of the time, at least for that moment, they're sitting with their caregiver and having that shared reading experience that's so important. If you're having trouble with a transition, like giving a book or a prop back, I'll often say, let's sing goodnight to our shakers and put them away and sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. This can help ease that sticking point. Remember, never take something away from a toddler as they are likely to resist or cry. Instead, try offering them a trade, like giving them a book to replace the shaker. Or another successful strategy is to allow them to be independent by putting the items away themselves. I usually walk around the room with a bag to collect props and encourage each child to drop it in the bag and then praise them effusively for it. We always do an activity with the toddlers and I usually try to have two prepared. 
If the group's really restless, I'll often change the order of the program on the fly and move the interactive activity um, more towards the beginning as opposed to having it when we normally would at the end. Crafts can be really great with this age because of the early literacy skills they build. Um, however, I'm not the craftiest person, so I tend to focus less on this element and more on play activities like games, dancing, sorting things based on color or shape. There are tons of great activities you can do with Play-Doh, like counting or making pretend cookies or shapes. Um, you can see in the picture we've incorporated some parachute play with some fall leaves for a fall theme and lots of different things. Um, when I do offer more traditional crafts, I find that parents have little patience for long crafts that require a lot of help, so I try to keep it really simple. Crafts I do with toddlers often include a sensory element like feathers or foam shapes they can glue onto paper. But watch out. Remember, some children at this age are still putting things in their mouth, so beware of choking hazards. Glue, scribbling, and tearing paper or crumpling paper are all great activities that develop fine motor skills and are achievable by young toddlers. We end the program with a simple thank you rhyme and our goodbye song. And as we said, most families choose to head out to the children's room and pick out books, play, and socialize further. So music and movement is our early childhood music class opportunity. And we talked about this in the baby webinar as well because we do offer it for ages zero to six. But it's especially fun with toddlers who are constantly moving their bodies anyway. Uh, we discussed how the use of small percussive instruments like bells and shakers are great with babies, and with toddlers you can add rhythm sticks or drums to the mix. These instruments help children develop with muscular development and coordination. Just be careful if you have a mixed age group as loud toddler musicians can startle young babies and make them cry. Moving to music, dancing, swaying, running, and jumping help children begin to understand how their bodies work. These movements also help them gain muscle control and improve balance. Many traditional storytime songs you already know, like, again, Head, Shoulders, Ease, and Toes, or If You're Happy and You Know It, that focus on different body parts, uh, help develop gross motor skills and body awareness, and can easily be incorporated into a music and movement program. With the toddler group, we also use, I do, we do a lot of stop and go activities like dancing and then stopping music or musical chairs, which are helpful because all children need to know how to or need to learn how to stop what they're doing. Playing games that incorporate the concept of stop gives children the opportunity to practice regulating their behavior and following directions. In music and movement, we sing and use the library's collection of music CDs, and favorite artists include The Wiggles, Jim Gill, Lori Berkner Band, and Raffi. As I said, we also use lots of instruments like maracas, tambourines, bells, drums, and rhythm sticks, and props include scarves, balls, and a parachute. I have to say, if you've never used a parachute with preschools or toddlers, it is just about the most exciting thing in the world, and <laughs> they love it and can stay engaged with it for a surprisingly long time. Um, so the music and movement programs have been incredibly successful for us. Now, Art Lab is one of our newer programs here at the FFL. In this program, we explore color, textures, and different mediums while encouraging self-expression and creative thinking. Some of the activities can include coloring, finger painting, or working with clay or dough. The program is designed for ages 1 to 6, and we always make sure to include a disclaimer that just lets parents know that sometimes projects are going to be messy, so consider bringing a smock or wearing some play clothes. The program will vary depending on the topic and the activities, but there is a general outline we try to follow. We usually start out by reading a story and then spending a few minutes talking about the book. We talk about the images, the colors, and the content. And then we try to offer two activities, a smaller one to start out, and then usually a more involved, sometimes group activity. This is really important because toddlers move quickly and they're probably not going to focus on just one activity for a full 30 minutes. 
So in a recent program, we focused on color and painting. We started out by reading Eric Carle's book, The Artist Who Painted a Blue Horse, and we talked about the book, the different animals, and the different colors we saw. We had some tables set up with tablecloths and drop cloths on the floor. We let each child paint their own individual picture using the different finger paints and some animal shaped sponges that we had. So after they spent time making their own picture, we let them collaborate on one large sheet of paper we laid out on the table. So they were able to interact with each other and they painted together while drawing pictures, mixing the different colors, and just really exploring what they could create. Art is a really great way to help children see different shapes all around them. Um, in another session, children use pre-cut shapes to make collages. Awareness of shapes helps build a foundation for the math concepts children need to learn later in school. And circles and triangles are also parts of letters. So being able to see and recognize those shapes also aids in letter recognition and literacy building. Children and parents really enjoy this program because once we give them a focus or a direction, the children love going off and creating on their own. And parents really love the opportunity to play and interact with their child during the program. Art Lab is really about focusing on the process rather than the end product. Um, as you know, most toddlers won't show much interest in their own works when they're done. So instead, we focus on creating a shared experience for parents and children. So the last program we're going to talk about is Smart Play, which was similar to the Let's Learn program I mentioned in the Babies webinar. And it's all about creating an enriching free play space um, that is built around the research of every child ready to read. If you're lucky, you might have a permanent play space for toddlers in your children's room, but you can also work to create temporary theme-based play programs. Smart Play is a library program for ages 0 to 6 that uses educational toys and materials to promote early literacy. Children and parents can rotate through stations made up of appealing and unique toys that will stimulate their imagination and expose them to letters, sounds, and words. All the content used in Smart Play fulfills one or more of the six early literacy skills and promotes the five practices, talking, singing, reading, writing, and playing. Smart Play is a self-guided program um, which gives toddlers, babies, and preschoolers the autonomy to explore and learn at their own pace. The program is held in our multi-purpose community room um, and does take some time to set up but requires little facilitation and can be run by a trusted volunteer. Uh, some basic rules that we have for the program include um, remembering to pick up materials when people are done, taking turns, which again is an important skill anyway, um, and sharing. And we always reinforce that smart play is for kids and grown-ups, so we really want parents to be on the floor playing with their children. Smart play has a lot of different materials, um, and we were just going to run through some of the things that we offer. So we have flannel boards, large flannel boards for storytelling with flannel pieces. Um, and books that go along with them. So I've seen parents read The Three Little Bears while their children um, act out the story on the flannel board. There are puzzles, um, a roadway rug with plastic race cars and airplanes, and signs, which helps develop print awareness. Um, we also have shopping carts, a cash register, and plastic food, which aids in um, that pretend play, so it's like a mini grocery store. We have the puppet and the puppet theater from the children's room and library, uh, pretend library with uh, shelves and a scanner and books so kids can pretend to check out books and um, model library behavior that they see. In addition to craft supplies for um, scribbling and writing, um, a new addition was we have a little post office station where kids can scribble or write letters to us and we'll write back, and costumes for dress up. We also have an alphabet mat, which is like a, a game with letters, um, letter bean bags, and big um, magnetic letters that they can spell words out with. So again, these in, um, incorporate all of the six early literacy skills and the practices, and is a really um, fantastic program that people have even compared us to the Strong Museum of Play. It's like a, sort of a mini version of that where they can come to this very enriching space and interact with their child. So finally, we wanted to talk about our policy with siblings. And while we work hard to create developmentally 
appropriate programs for specific age groups, we know that siblings are a fact of life. It isn't always possible or realistic to expect that parents will be able to find alternative activities or child care for older or younger children so they can attend a toddler program. We said this in the baby webinar, but we try, again, we want to say that we try to be as welcoming as possible to families because we know that bringing a brother or sister might make the difference between whether or not a family comes to the library. It's more important to us that families feel comfortable and welcome than that a program is 100% developmentally appropriate for all participants. Plus, as you've seen, even if you restrict your program to a narrow age range, participants will still represent different stages of physical, cognitive, and emotional development. Welcoming older siblings supports the development of toddlers by supporting the whole family. Again, I said this last time as well, but by welcoming siblings into story time, we open up a space for the discussion of practicalities that parents deal with every day. So how do you select a story that will appeal to a baby and a toddler, and how do you read to both of them at the same time? If you have younger children in the audience, you can include some activities for them too. So throw in a bouncing rhyme or a finger play that toddlers can do themselves and that caregivers can do for the babies. And for older children, find ways to have them help you by passing out materials or holding the book. Libraries can offer resources and strategies for incorporating early literacy into the real lives of family by being inclusive of the family as a whole. So that is our last piece of content. We have the references and resources that we used um, in the webinar available on this screen. And then we have some additional um, library resources um, on our thank you slide. So thank you. And thanks to both of you for putting together a great presentation today. Um, I'm going to uh, start uh, reviewing some of the questions that were we're planted through the presentation and we'll work our way down the list. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, the first question I see uh, is from Kayla uh, asking, is the FFL Family Room open all hours when the library is open? Yes, the FFL Family Room is open all the operating hours of the library. And a follow-up to that, Debbie asks, is there a staff member in the family room? How do you keep toys, et cetera, from being destroyed? And <laughs> in the same breath, Lisa asks, who cleans up and how frequently? Um, that's a good question. My, my desk is kind of adjacent to the family room, so we don't have a staff member supervising the space. And, you know, when I'm on, on the front reference desk or, or you know, doing a program, I'm not back there either. And we um, rely on parents to be respectful and clean up after their kids. Um, we do have a great group of pages and teen volunteers who will come in and part of their duties are to help clean up the family room. And um, we also, you know, the librarian who opens the library and whoever closes also does a sweep just as we clean and straighten all of our spaces. Okay, and we're going to way down. Uh, let's see, how many staff members do you have working with you? Um, like in general, or in like in a in a specific program, or let's see if Michelle perhaps um, gives us a little bit more. Um, okay. I could say um, Kristen and I are the um, two librarians who do story times. So usually it's just one of us. So um, I facilitate the First Steps program myself, and Kristen has facilitated Art Lab and some of the other programs. So there's usually only one staff member in the room. If we're anticipating a really big crowd, sometimes we'll have another staff member or a volunteer um, come in and help us pass out supplies and, and kind of facilitate. But again, um, our expectation is always especially with these young kids, that the parents are staying. And so the parents are expected to be involved and to help. Um, so that helps with the staff issue. And um, do you disinfect the toys or wash the puppets? Uh, if so, uh, what do you use? And how often do you do it? <laughs> That's a good question. We do try to regularly go through and um, we use Lysol and spray 
the train table down and spray, you know, the different hard toys down. Um, we don't wash the puppets too often. Um, I don't see too many kids putting the puppets in their mouths, so I don't, I try not to worry about it too much. Um, <laughs> but we, we do all of our hard toys and the, the board books we wipe down. Um, you know, they'll try to wipe them down at circulation when they come in. But we ask parents to be aware that it is a public space like any other public space and to take some of their responsibility for using hand sanitizer or whatever precautions they want to take with their child in any public space. And uh, how much signage do you have in the FFL family room to assist parents with knowing what the stuff, uh, what stuff is there and how to play and learn together? That's a good question. We try not to overwhelm people with signage. Um, we have kind of um, a model of, of elegance that we try to follow in our spaces and with our promotions where um, we're, we're giving the information people need but not being cluttered and overwhelming. So we do have um, we do have some signs up that are fun and kid friendly and they usually are like one word. <laughs> so it'll say, um, for example, there was a, there's a sign in the uh, puppet theater that says talk. Um, there's one by the television that's a little bit longer. I think it says music and we have a little card with instructions for how to turn on the TV in case people can't figure out how to do that. But most often, um, people are freely playing and collaborating in the spaces. And if they have specific questions, they'll come find, um, either me in the room or the librarian on the reference desk to, to ask them. But for the most part, I think the toys that we have are really intuitive and the kids play with them and interact them with them in the way that's um, engaging and exciting for them. Okay. And are you ex uh, using existing shelving for your pic picture books? We are using existing shelving. Um, the books I see, uh, the books will remain spine out. So the labels are going on the um, on the bottom of the spine. They'll be color coded. So right now we are in the process of our plan is to sticker and and change the records for the entire collection, and then we'll we'll move the books. Um, so we're going to go through that process first. Right now, all the books are still shelved in alphabetical order, and when the process is complete, we'll move them. And um, at that point, it'll also give us a better sense of how um, big some of the categories are when we're done and how they look on the physical shelves. And um, we'll know at that point if we're happy with the results or if we need to do some, some tweaking of our criteria or of the, the categories that we have. Okay. And let's see here, um, do you have instances where parents leave their children in the family room? If so, how have you handled it? We don't have that problem too often. I will occasionally, um, occasionally we'll have a, a, a distressed child who is looking for a parent. Um, they're not usually toddlers. Parents have been pretty good about not leaving toddlers, but like a, they left a preschooler and went to browse somewhere else. And um, we handle it by, you know, if the child is distressed, we'll obviously walk around the library with them and help them find the parent um, and let them know that, um, you know, that it's their responsibility to supervise their child. And while there might be a staff member in the room, um, we're not babysitting or or watching very carefully what their children are doing. So the expectation is that they're gonna stay. Um, and like I said, we've been we've been pretty fortunate with that. And we have set up um, some some elements that are helpful, like the adult computers help because the parents can be working or something and, and right next to the, the kid. Um, so they're not like in the adult computer lab doing that while their kids playing. So we try to be accommodating and I think our patrons try to be as well. Okay. And Michelle asked for part three of the webinar. Is it three hours as listed on the website or just one hour? That was a mistake, which has now been fixed. Uh, it's, it should be about the same time as, uh, span as this one, about an hour and some time for questions. Uh, I have now, before we go, keep going, I posted some links here, uh, the, the survey, please fill it out. It helps us learn. It helps us, uh, 
uh, make the, uh, the presentations better, and it uh, helps us make sure that we're providing the right offerings for you for professional development. Um, uh, you see the YouTube link there. That's a playlist. Uh, the first uh, video or the first webinar is already up there, and this one will be uh, soon. Um, and then we've got a link to the next webinar, as we mentioned, uh, uh, part three, which is coming up soon, as well as a link to our in-person workshop that will be held at FFL. So um, just uh, check those out uh, as you get the chance, and please, please, please fill out that survey. Uh, then, uh, let's see here. Um, uh, Michelle, how do you let parents know that they need to clean up after their children in the family room? Um, I usually, <laughs> that's a good question. Usually through conversation, um, I try to say in a, in a non-offensive manner, like, oh, it'd be really helpful uh, if you could clean up when you're done playing. Um, or sometimes if I overhear parents saying like, um, oh, we should clean up, I'll say, thank you. We really appreciate your help in keeping the room neat. Um, Sometimes even like having a, a staff person or a volunteer walk in there and start picking up helps to remind parents that that's also their responsibility and they'll, they'll join in and kind of help you. Um, but I mean, it is, it is an extra thing that we do and you know, you'll always have like a couple of people who aren't as respectful of the space as they should be, which I'm sure you've all experienced in, in any space. And we feel that the service and the, um, value that it provides is worth that little bit of extra effort on our part. Okay. And uh, some people have pointed out that when I posted the link, it uh, had smooshed things together. So I've reposted it here and um, the other link should be, should be working. Um, and uh, let's see here. And uh, Kayla asks, uh, Oh, uh, there are adult computers in the family room. Uh, how many, how many are there? So they're not, it's not actually in the, so the, there's the family room and then it kind of links right to the rest of the children's room. So in the children's room, which is again, right next to the, the family room, they're, they flow into one another. There are the um, four children's AWE computers and then there's one adult computer station that's right in that space. So just one in the front of the room. And then all the way in the back of the room, which we'll be talking about a little more in the preschool webinar, because it's stuff for slightly older kids in the back there. Um, we do have an, a second adult computer station. So two computers, adult computers. And it looks like all three of those links got smooshed when I uh, put them in. So let me just repost them one by one here. There you go. There's that one. Here's the workshop. And here is the playlist. So you guys should have all those there. Um, and I think, let's see here, I think that might be all of the questions. Anybody else have anything they'd like to ask before we close out for today? And uh, while people are thinking, let me just put this out there. If you would like a certificate of attendance, we it's not a participation certificate and there's no assigned CEUs. However, we can give you a certificate of attendance. Just email me. I'm at mcopel at clrc.org. Uh, put that right there. Just drop me a line and request a certificate of attendance and uh, we'll have one generated and sent out to you. Um, but uh, with that, uh, oh, one last question. Uh, what is your opinion on digital stories for this age group? That's a good question. We're actually going to be talking about that um, a little bit more. We're going to actually, we're going to be talking about digital story time um, and early literacy iPads in depth in the preschool webinar. Um, the, I, I know they, re, they recently revised it, but previously um, the American Society of Pediatrics had a recommendation of no screen time for children under two years of age. Um, so we had been following that and, and marketing most of our digital story times for like some two, but really like more like the four and five-year-olds. Um, although again, we never disallow or, or bar siblings from a group so we do sometimes get younger children um but we will be talking about that more in depth in the preschool session great 
And with that, we'll close out for today. Thanks everybody for attending and thanks to our fantastic speakers and the Fayetteville Free Library for providing this content. Uh, as always, let us know here at CLRC what you're looking for for professional development. You can drop me, drop me an email, fill out that survey. Uh, we're here to provide programming for you to, to make your experience uh, uh, building your community and your library better. So thanks so much and we'll see you at the next webinar. Take care guys.